All right, I am back here on the podcast talking New York Giants football with the guy who's covered them for a long time for WFAN. The great Paul Latino is on the line. Paul, how are you? Uh, very good to talk to you. Doing well. Hope you're enjoying the summer, although I think the humidity is about to pick up. The humidity is picking up, but, you know, that's a good, it's a good time to go hop in the pool and get ready to listen to some football talk. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And to be honest, Joe Judge likes the stress conditioning. And as you know, Bill Parcells and Tom Coughlin years ago used to love humidity at training camp because that really made the guys work hard and prepare them for the season. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start right there with Joe Judge because he's running a very tough camp this year. Obviously, we heard about the brawl the other day when we had Daniel Jones at the bottom of the pile, lots of penalty laps, and he was very upset. What was that experience like for you seeing that all unfold? Well, you know, uh, look, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. That was probably the most tame fracas that I've ever seen. Uh, I've seen much worse than that over my years. I I actually, to be frank with you, I bristle at the term brawl because it wasn't. A brawl implies punches, kicks, people being thrown down and wrestled to the ground. That's nothing like what happened. Uh, we had uh, seen a, a couple of players shove each other, uh, fall down, and then other players trying to pick them up and try to pull them apart, and then they just basically fell all over each other. It looked more like guys going after a fumble and a pile of bodies rather than a brawl or a steel cage match or whatever else the, the uh, writers wanted to term it. Look, I guess they just haven't been around football training camps for four decades as I have because that was the furthest thing from a brawl I've ever seen. Now, the whole team did get involved. Everybody was trying to pull everybody else off, so the pile got bigger and bigger and bigger. And Joe Judge, to his credit, wanted to hammer home the point that you can't have pushing and shoving because if you do it in practice, you're going to wind up doing it in a game that will draw a penalty or perhaps an ejection, which will hurt the team. And furthermore, if you do anything like that during practice and guys are falling over each other, well, somebody could get hurt. And that's not going to do the team any good either. And that is why Judge was so angry and he penalized them as he did. It wasn't because of the actual physical nature of what happened. It's in principle that that stuff should not happen. Yeah, that makes some sense. I also feel like it's one thing that's real odd for the Giants in terms of the camp. I feel like we've had at least four guys retire when they get to camp, which seems very unusual. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Four guys retire in the middle of camp? Well, it's happened around the NFL. In fact, Graham Deneau, who was a veteran kicker, was asked by the reporters today, and he'd ever seen it. And he said, sure. I've seen a handful of guys, you know, retire before many years, many times. It does happen, especially now, because you're dealing with still very difficult protocols coming off of a year and a half of COVID situations where the league and the Players Association has had to really put all kinds of restrictions on these players. And it, it, look, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. Mike, it's not as fun to be a player right now as it was pre-COVID. It's also not as fun to be a beat reporter as it was during the days of pre-COVID. That's just a fact. Uh, now, you know, Benjamin, he was coming out of retirement anyway, so I don't put much stock in anything he says going back into retirement. Uh, then you had uh, Davis and Looney, who explained to Joe Judge that they had family issues that they had to take care of. And so they retired and that's understandable. And now you have Fulton, the latest one to go. And judge said, in addition to a business and family issue, he also felt like his body just wasn't responding as it should. And that's why he decided to go. The last three players, Davis Looney and and Fulton were all told by Joe judge that the door is open, that if they want to come back, he will welcome them back. I would add one other thing, though, and Joe Judge did not say this. Any player who is not physically, mentally, and emotionally invested in giving 100% on the field at training camp better walk away because if he's not going to give it his all, he is a safety risk to himself and to his teammates, and better that he walk away now than do it once the 53-man roster is set. 
I completely agree with that. It makes a lot of sense. Speaking of the 53-man roster, one guy who's going to be there is Daniel Jones. It was a big year. It's his third year on the team. It got some weapons there, finally helped him out a little bit. What have you seen so far at Daniel Jones at training camp? He's been a bit inconsistent. On days when he's been really, really good, he's been razor sharp. The last two days prior to this taping, the offense clearly had the better of the defense, and Jones was really winging it good. Now, not so much on this particular afternoon where the run game looked pretty good, the short passing game looked pretty good, but the medium and long-range passing game, the defense clearly had the edge. Look, the Giants have probably one of the top five secondaries in the National Football League, so it's not out of the question that those guys will get the upper hand on occasion anyway because they're just that talented and deep. But I will tell you, there have been certain practices where Jones has been inconsistent with his accuracy, and I'm sure that he will continue to work on that before the regular season starts. Oh, for sure. I think that will help him out a lot is obviously the return of Saquon Barkley from the ACL injury, and I know they're bringing him along slowly at camp. Like, have they gotten the sense that like Saquon will be ready to go on opening day, or is this something we should keep an eye on? Well, I mean, I, I've said all along that given the track record for the kind of injury that he had and when the surgery took place, that it would be unrealistic to expect Barkley to get the full workload, 20 to 25 touches for all 17 weeks of this season. I have always cautioned people to say that the first week or two, or maybe even three, he would have a lighter load if he's even activated for the first game of the season. Now, let me make it clear. Nobody truly knows exactly what's going on because while the trainers can test him, they can rehab him, and they can bring him along, on any given day, his rehab could have a setback. Or on any given day, they could push through a hurdle, and all of a sudden, he's accelerating his rehab. So those, those things are always fluid. And Joe Judge has been very specific and adamant in saying that there is no exact timetable on when Barkley will return to the practice field, which then means he's going to have to get out there and at least take some jostling before they even consider putting him in a game. And, and neither one of those things have happened yet, obviously. So it remains to be seen. But I'd be shocked if you see him at all during the preseason. I mean, come on, clearly, let's be obvious about this. And again, whether or not he's even active for game number one, I do think the first few games that he plays, the first two or three perhaps, maybe even four, you will see limited touches. He'll be on a pitch count. And people have to take that into account, which is why Devontae Booker is a very important signing during the offseason. Yeah, absolutely. He's going to be a big help for them to try and eat Saquon back in the mix. I think another thing that could help him out is the offensive line, which... Curiously, they did not really address the offseason. They let Kevin Zeitler go to save some money on the cap. They trust the guys they have in there, and the line was a big issue last year. Do you think this line is going to get better as this year goes on? Well, I do think it was better during the second half of the season, and even, quite honestly, there was a stretch there, what, five games in the middle of the year. They were averaging well over 130 yards a game on the ground. So they were clearly getting the run-blocking stuff down and improving. Uh, that's really indisputable. The facts are there. Now, the pass protection, well, that was inconsistent during the course of the year. It was better in the second half of the season than it was the first, but it still did remain inconsistent. So, obviously, the youngsters on that line, you know, they're all going to have to continue to show growth and, you know, have to live up to the potential that the Giants believe they have. You'd like to believe that Rob Sale, the new offensive line coach who has impeccable credentials and also an Alabama background where he was connected to Joe Judge, and then Pat Flaherty, remember, he was the O-line coach for two Super Bowl champions with the Giants. He's back in the building now helping out that offensive line. You'd like to believe that those two guys will give them an extra boost as they try to improve. Yeah, I think one thing is also going to be the calling card for the Giants here is obviously their defense. Last year, Patrick Graham did a great job of that unit. They got even better the offseason when they brought a Dory Jackson to help the secondary. So what do you think the expectations are for this defense? Do you think we could see a continuation of what we saw last year, or do you think there's a chance there might be a little regression? Oh, I think it's going to be better. 
I mean, I think the Giants finished, what, in total yardage 12th, I think, overall in total yardage defense. Now, that, of course, can be a misleading stat, but I think it's safe to say no matter what number you looked at, the Giants were a fringe top 10 defense last year. I think that's pretty fair, regardless of what metric you decide to place emphasis on. Uh, And who's missing from that defense? Okay, Dalvin Tomlinson, the guy in the middle of that defensive line, a really good player. And a guy who everybody wanted back but became a cap casualty. Well, what do they do? They go out and they get Danny Shelton, who is a big, wide-body run-stopper, so he'll play in obvious rundowns, and then they'll mix and match guys on pass-downs. So I don't think they're going to lose a whole lot at that one position. But what do they gain? Well, you got Leonard Williams coming off a career year. You got Dexter Lawrence, who just looks like in every game he's played over the first two years of his NFL career, he has gotten better. And I anticipate him to take another jump this year. You got Blake Martinez as steady as ever. He's good for 140 plus tackles. He's proven that over the course of the last few years. You've got a slew of outside linebackers right now who either are new to the team or coming off of injury. So you'd like to think with those numbers that somebody will rise and the cream will will get to the top and and somebody will step up and who knows? Maybe it'll be Aziz Ojolari. I I never believed that rookie pass rushers will very often make a huge impact in their first seasons in the league, but maybe Ojolari can. I know a lot of people who think very, very highly of him. And if he can be that guy, watch out. And I don't even have to tell you about the secondary. You already know. They're they're a top five, maybe top three secondary in the National Football League. So that's gotten better. When you consider Xavier McKinney, you know, only played a month and a half of the season last year sparingly. Uh, You consider that Darnay Holmes showed dramatic improvement in the slot during the course of December. You add a Dory Jackson, a legit cover corner, to go opposite Bradbury. And I didn't even say anything about Peppers and Ryan the other two safeties. And I mean, come on now. If this safety, if this secondary is not a top five, then somebody's not watching football. Oh, for sure. The secondary is great. It's going to be a big help in the NFC East with Dak Prescott coming back and Ryan Fitzpatrick stabilizing the Washington offense. I feel like they their defense gives them a chance to win this division. Well, I think so. I mean, look, let me put you this way. There's no one that's going to dispute that the Giants have the best balance in the division between offense, defense, and special teams. Okay? I think that's pretty obvious. Dallas potentially has the most explosive offense. Washington may have the most dangerous defense because of their defensive line, which is just absolutely sensational. Although, the Giants have a better back seven than Washington does. But Washington's defensive line is just so dominant that If you wanted to give them the slight edge over the Giants, I'll let you have that. But again, the Giants back seven, they they don't take a backseat to anybody. And then special teams, look, Graham Gano's got 30 consecutive field goal makes, a Giants team record as we start the season. Riley Dixon's a very solid punter, and we expect Kadarius Toney to be the return guy. So, you know, come on. The Giants aren't weak in any level when you consider that the offense, you know, is on the up and they've added Kenny Galladay. Uh, they'll have a healthy uh, Darius Slayton. They've added Kyle Rudolph to the tight end room. You know, you anticipate that the offensive line is on the up, which is all going to help Daniel Jones. I mean, no, the Giants are the most balanced team in the division. There's no question. And they were 4-2 and two in the NFC East last year. And by the way, yeah, Washington did win the division, but the Giants beat them twice. So how could the Giants not at least be co-favorites? If you don't want to make them the favorites, all right, I'll fight you on that. But how could they not at least be the co-favorites in the division? Yeah, I think it's certainly a fair point. In terms of like matchups, though, I feel like Washington might be the team that gives them the most trouble because Dallas, who knows, at Dak, because they always the shoulder thing. He's not throwing for a little bit. Washington's front four. Well, they have no defense. Yeah, the defense. Because the Cowboys have no defense. They are not balanced at all. They're strictly an offensive juggernaut. They don't have defense, and I don't think their special teams are very good. And Philadelphia is just a mess. Yeah, I think watching the thing that would scare me the most if I'm a Giant fan is just the front four going against the offensive lines. You acknowledge the pass protection still probably has work to do. That could be a matchup issue for them. So as you can see them very early in the season on a short turnaround. 
Well, if you believe in the fundamentals of football, it always comes down to the trenches. And then the second fundamental of football is defense wins. And clearly, Washington and the Giants have the two best defenses by far in the division. So those should be the two teams that realistically have a chance to win the NFC East. But let's not forget, okay, Ryan Fitzpatrick, the new quarterback in Washington, how many playoff games has he been into in 17 NFL seasons? The answer is none. As many as Daniel Jones has been to, uh, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick has been Mr. Up and Down, journeyman inconsistency his entire career. Once he won one game with the Jets, uh, 10 games with the Jets in 2015 with a similar team, a team that had a dominant defense and he was managing the offense and he had his career year. And that was seven years ago. And they finished 10 and 6. So I personally believe Washington's high watermark is 9. I think the Giants' high watermark could be as high as 11. Yeah, that would be certainly interesting to see. And obviously, we're in the preseason coming up right now, and we've seen the Giants find these guys in the course of camp over the years who've made their stars in the preseason come big names like Victor Cruz. Are there any guys in camp right now that caught your eye that are not necessarily on the top of minds for Giants fans? Well, I think we all pretty much know who the starters are going to be on both sides of the ball. So I, I don't necessarily know that they're, quote, sleepers right now. I mean, Tay Crowder, who was Mr. Irrelevant, the last player drafted in last year's selection process, wound up starting a half a dozen games, had a fumble recovery for a touchdown against Washington at MetLife Stadium. And honestly, he's had a good camp. And it wouldn't shock me if he continues to get a ton of playing time you know, in the Giants nickel package as as one of their two inside linebackers, you know, the guy who's going to play next to Martinez. You know, he's obviously, as being the last player picked in the draft last year, you know, he's not highly thought of by a lot of people outside the Giants draft room. But I'll tell you this, uh, he's got a lot of ability, and he'll make a lot more plays this year if he winds up being a regular guy in that sub package. So that would be potentially a little bit of a sleeper to look for. And I will tell you, a guy who has had a sensational week, a second week of training camp, uh, six round draft pick, Odarius Williams. Uh, my goodness, this cornerback has been all over the field every day. He's noticeable. And as we take this interview today, he just had his best day at practice. He, he is just really lighting things up out there. I just don't know that there's a lot of room to play him because the Giants have so many people who can play in the secondary. I don't know how he gets on the field. And it's a good problem to have for the Giants to have that many corners, especially in the passing league. No question. And think about this, too. They also have Julian Love. And we don't even talk about him. But this guy can play corner. He can play a little slot. He can also play safety. And right now, there's no place for him in the regular rotation, you know, when you consider he's the fourth safety and the fourth corner. <laughs> I mean, how good is your secondary if you could say that? Yeah, that's pretty good. My last question is obviously the preseason. We're recording on Friday, August 6th. They were about oh, just over a week away from the first preseason game. And it's unusual because it's Joe Judge's second year. is obviously his first preseason because of COVID, so... Yeah, has he given any indication of how he wants to approach the preseason in terms of like getting starters reps, or is he not really given that out yet? Well, he's told us today that because there's no fourth preseason game, he wants to give as many of his young players as many snaps as possible in the preseason opener against the Jets. Uh, so that's what I'm expecting to see. It was the first indication we've gotten from him on how he plans to do his player deployment. So uh, you will see a lot of the second and third and fourth stringers in that Jets game on the 14th. Then, of course, they've got uh, the Cleveland game and the New England game to finish off the preseason. But those Browns and Patriots games will be preceded by two days of practices with those opponents. Uh, and those are going to be very big for Joe Judge, as he has said, because they've only got three preseason games. Those dual practice sessions, he's going to treat them like preseason games because that's going to be an opportunity to see his players against other helmets. So um, that's his philosophical approach. Uh, and, you know, look, we've all been very curious about how coaches around the league are going to do this now with only three preseason opportunities. 
Yeah, for sure. Paul, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I hope you follow you on social media and keep up with your coverage for WFAN. Well, appreciate it very much. Uh, at Giants WFAN, uh, I'm there all the time. We do what we can to keep the fans informed. It's been a pleasure, and I uh, certainly enjoy talking to you. Absolutely, Paul. Look forward to following you on WFAN this season. Thanks for all the time. All right, man. Anytime.